most people, when they think of Christmas, think about certain things. I remember as a kid, one of the things I always looked forward to were the, Chris, the TV Christmas specials. And some of those you might remember, like Frosty the Snowman, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Everyone always says I'm a Grinch. I don't know what that's about. Santa Claus is coming to town, the year without Santa. We could go on and on and on, but there's a common theme with almost all of those Christmas specials. None of them talk about the real meaning of Christmas, except Charlie Brown. We've talked about that before, too. And some people think about the Christmas songs. You turn your radio on anytime after November 1st, and you can find Christmas songs playing nonstop. Christmas songs like, All I Want for Christmas is You, Last Christmas, I know you're thinking of these songs as I say them, White Christmas, Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, I'll Be Home for Christmas, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, Jingle Bell Rock, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Santa Baby, Blue Christmas, Winter Wonderland, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. A common theme with all of those Christmas songs is they have nothing to do with the real meaning of Christmas. You could turn on your TV, you could go to the Hallmark station and other stations that play Christmas movies nonstop, and you will be hard-pressed to find something that talks about the birth of Jesus. In our country, we have fun traditions around the Christmas holiday. We have fun songs, fun celebrations. But we have to remember all of those things are cheap imitations of the true meaning of Christmas. It's fun that it snows, but snow has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus. It's fun that we can... We can um, celebrate uh, this time of year. It, it's fun that we can get together with family and friends and watch funny things on TV and listen to music that fills our heart with, with, with happiness. But none of those things compare to the greatest story ever told that begins with the birth of Jesus. So turn with me this morning in your Bibles, or you can follow on the screen, and let's read the story of the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 1 says this, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Let's just stop there. Something that we see here in the beginning, we read these verses, and sometimes we don't stop to think about all that is going on here. First of all, we know that the angels came to Mary and Joseph and said, you will have a child, he will be the Christ, he will be the Messiah, he will fulfill the promises given to David, he will sit on the throne. One of the problems was, though Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth, and the Old Testament is very clear that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So how does God get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. Think about this for a second. Who does God use to help fulfill this prophecy in the life of Mary and Joseph? Caesar Augustus. Think about that for a second. This was all a part of God's plan. Caesar Augustus has this registration. Everyone is supposed to go to their hometown and register so that they can count and they can know how many people are everywhere else. But this is not just the the crazy whim of of a Roman emperor. This is the plan of God working through people like Caesar Augustus who had no clue what was going on. 
But God was using this to bring Mary and Joseph from where they were living in Nazareth to Bethlehem at the exact time Mary was going to give birth so that the Messiah could be born in Bethlehem. That's pretty amazing. God is pretty amazing. God organized and and did all of these things so that his word would be fulfilled completely. So it tells us as we go back to the passage in verse 5 that they went to Bethlehem to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son And wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. When we look at this story, you know, we've we've added a lot of different elements to this. You know, the the innkeeper that says there's no room. The passage doesn't say that. It just says they couldn't find a place to stay. Think about this. The Christ, the Messiah, and there's no place for them to stay. There's no room for the Messiah to be born. And so God sends his son into this world. And he's born in a barn. He's laid in a manger, which is a feeding trough for animals. When we think about the birth of the Christ, this is not the way anybody would have imagined. When we think of the birth of the Son of God, we would think of so many different ways that he could come into the world, but he came with no home, no place to stay. He was out in They had to put him in a manger because there was nothing for him to lay him in. And through all of this, we see the love of God for humanity, that God himself would allow himself to be humbled, to be born in this way, to come to the earth in this way. Well, the story of God's love and and the birth of Jesus doesn't end there. It continues in verse 8. And we're introduced to some very unlikely participants in this story of the birth of Jesus. If we would write this story, we would think that those who would be there for the birth of Jesus would be kings, priests, we would, we would think that those who would be there to witness the birth of Jesus would be the powerful, the important, the, the scholars, the, the, those who studied scripture. But just like God chose to send his son to be laid in, in a feeding trough for animals, we see that God's love doesn't reach just to the rich and the powerful and the influential. It reaches to everyone. Because it tells us in verse 8 that in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now when we think of the shepherd, we might think of, of, of you know, how, we, how we handle livestock today. But that's not the case back then. Being a shepherd wasn't a prestigious occupation. It wasn't a very significant occupation. Basically, you had to live outdoors with the animals. You, you had to be gone for stretches of time. It, it wasn't something that was looked highly upon in those days. And so there were these, of all of the people that God could proclaim the birth of his son, he chose shepherds. Look at verse 9. It says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be to all people, for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, peace with those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in, the man, in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that they had been told concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. God sent his son to be born without a place to stay. He proclaims the message to a group of shepherds who witness something unbelievable. God, when he sent his son into the world, he didn't send him to be the son of a king to live in luxury and comfort. He sent him as a poor child, surrounded by poor shepherds, insignificant people. But yet we see so much about the love of God through this story. We see so much about what God was doing when we Think about how Jesus was born and how he came into this world. And one of the, the things I want to focus on as we, as we think about the celebration of the birth of Jesus is the message that the angels gave to the shepherds. The message that the angel gave to the shepherd, first of all, was, I've got some really good news to tell you. This is... And, and the way it's, it's worded is kind of funny. Good news of great joy. And, and the reason it's worded that way is to emphasize how good this is. The, the angel has something to tell the shepherds that is, that is something that is so good it will cause joy for all people that hear it. What's significant about that is the joy was not just for the shepherds. The joy can be ours as we, as we participate with the shepherds in celebrating what God is doing. The joy can be ours today because Jesus, when he came, he didn't just come for those shepherds. He came for the world. And so all people can participate in the joy of the message that the angels were bringing to the shepherds. And the message is in verse 11. It says, for unto you, think about that, for unto you, the angel is saying, this is for you. This gift of God is for you. For unto you, is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And I just want to look at two things as we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And point number one, the message that the angel brings to the shepherd is the baby that is born, Jesus, is our Savior. Remember, the angel said, unto you. This is a personal thing. Jesus didn't come just as, as some, some grand gesture or some, some, some broad um, illustration of what God was doing. This is a personal thing. We celebrate Christmas because Jesus came for us. He is not just the Savior. He is our Savior. And this is really good news because the Bible tells us that we cannot save ourselves. All throughout Scripture, we see people who think that they know 
they think they know the will of God. We especially see this in the New Testament with the Pharisees that think that they know what God's will is. They think they have everything figured out. And when Jesus comes and tells them they're sinners, they say, wait a second. We're not sinners. We don't need salvation. We, we see that there were people in Jesus' day who could not accept his message because they could not acknowledge that before God they were sinners and in need of salvation. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners. It doesn't matter how much we know about the Bible. It doesn't matter how long we've gone to church. It doesn't matter how many good things we do, how often we give to the poor or help feed those who are hungry. It doesn't matter. Before God, we are all sinners. And we all fall short. We cannot please God because we are lost because of our sin. We, the, we are in darkness and we cannot find the way. We live a life, so many people around us live lives that are pointless, that focus on things that don't matter, where they, where they focus on themselves or on selfishness or on materialism, and, and we can see them all around us just hopeless. And Jesus came to save us first from our sins, to pay the price that we couldn't pay, to be the representative of God's love and die on the cross for us. So the good news is Jesus came as our Savior to save us from our sins. But I think his, his salvation is more than just salvation for, from our sins, although that's a huge part of it. Not only that, he provides light in the darkness. One of the things Jesus says is, I am the light of the world. The point that Jesus was trying to make is, you're all walk, walking in darkness, but I have, I show you the way. I am the light. Have you ever been in pitch darkness? It's a miserable thing. There, I, have, I really struggle if I'm sleeping and it's pitch black and I can't see anything. I wake up in the middle of the night and I don't know where I am. And I start like, you know, panicking. Like, where am I? What's going on? And, but, but all that I need is, it can be the light of, of an alarm clock. That's enough. Because for that, it kind of orientates me and I know where I am. Sometimes it's just even the light underneath the door or something like that. Or just through the windows, you can see light coming in. But if I wake up and it's pitch black... I kind of panic a little bit, and it's scary. I wake up, and I have no clue where I am, but just a little bit of light is all that I need to give me peace. And thankfully, Jesus, as the light of the world, doesn't just give us a little bit of light. He blazes a spotlight before us to show us the way. He doesn't leave us in darkness. When we follow him and trust in him, we walk in the light as he is in the light. And because Jesus is our Savior, this should bring us great joy. This should bring us great joy that Jesus loved you and me while we were still in our sins. He didn't love us because we're good. He didn't love us because of we're such great people. He loved us when we were still sinners and he died for us while we were still sinners. We see illustrations of the, of the love of God as he pursues those who are his own. I, I love the story of Jesus where he talks about how the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after the one. The message there is that everybody's important to God. Everyone is significant to God. God loves everyone. We, see it go, we also see the, the story of the prodigal son who sins and, and hurts his father and does horrible things in his life. Yet when the father sees him coming home, 
he runs out to meet his son. We can have joy because God sent his son Jesus for the prodigal. He sent Jesus for that one sheep that has left the flock. We have joy because Jesus came as our Savior. This week as I was thinking about this passage, I, I searched online, what, are the, what is the greatest joy in life? And I got all kinds of answers. There was one that I kind of liked. It was uh, from a psychiatrist, Dr. Margaret Paul. And, you know, in her article, she talks about some of the things that sometimes people think about joy. You know, um, she, she says, she kind of asked the question, is joy getting love or approval? Because sometimes people associate being loved or getting the approval of people as, as things that bring them happiness and joy in life. Having lots of friends, being financially successful, being famous, being married, having children, um, having power, having a big house. And she also said winning the lottery. You know, when, when the lottery was a billion dollars not that long ago, yeah, there was probably a lot of people who thought, if I win this, my life will be set, right? But interestingly, she says none of those things what are what bring us joy. And this is a secular, secular person, by the way. And here's what she says. The greatest joy in life is the experience of sharing love. Now, before we go on, I have to tell you, this is not necessarily a biblical definition of joy. This is a secular definition of joy. That the greatest joys in life are when we share experiences of love. And I think we can see that th that might not be the whole picture of joy, but, but, but we all can understand probably the times of the greatest joy in our lives we think about maybe when we were married. We, we think about maybe when we had kids. And I know that when we first had Titus and then Anna, you know, holding them for the first time was an experience that ranks right up there as the best experiences in my life. Because there's, there's this great love that you have for that child. And although they don't understand love, the concept of love, you can tell that they love you too, right? As they just snuggle up with you, as they, you know, they, they know who their mom and dad are. It doesn't take too long. They just, they understand and they, they want their parents. And those experiences bring us, bring us joy. And what I think is amazing about the Christmas story is we experience sharing love with God. In the Christmas story, we experience the love of God when we celebrate the sending of Jesus to the earth for humanity and to save the world through his death on the cross. We have joy because Jesus is our Savior, because God loved us, because Jesus came to die on the cross. For us. Jesus came as our Savior, and that is something that should bring us great joy as we celebrate Christmas. And this joy is so much better than that gift that we get that we forget about in a year. Right? It's so much better than that gift that we get that we break within a week. I did that as a kid all the time. You get a present and it's broken within a week. Or you get that present and after you play for a few hours, you're kind of just done with it, right? That kind of joy is just fleeting. It's gone. But the joy that comes with knowing Jesus can never be taken away. The angel t told the shepherds that Jesus is born for them, for unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. What's really important about the celebration of Christmas is we remember that Jesus is not only our Savior, but point number two, Jesus is our Lord. The message of the angel was the Christ the Lord is born. 
Now, the word Christ is, is really just a representation of the, of the Hebrew idea of the Messiah. The Messiah has come. And when we understand who the Messiah was, when we look at the Old Testament description of the coming of the Messiah, we see that the Messiah is more than just a person. We see the Messiah is the chosen one of God, the one who is coming to fulfill the promises given to Abraham, the promises given to Moses, the promises given to David, the promises given throughout the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. Jesus is the fulfillment. And as the fulfillment of the promises of God, he brings us the kingdom of God. And as the Messiah, he's the king. He is the heir of David who will sit on the throne of David forever and ever. We have to remember when we celebrate Christmas, Jesus came as our Lord. Jesus came as the Christ. And I think in modern Christianity, we have gotten this idea. We see it in our worship songs. We see it all around that, that we want to think of Jesus as our friend. Jesus is our best friend. Sometimes, sometimes you listen to, to con music and, and G it's almost, we talk about how Jesus is your boyfriend. You know, it's like these love songs about Jesus. And it's important for us to love Jesus. It's important for us to know that we, we are sons of God through Jesus. And we have a special relationship where we can call out to the Father and call him Abba Father. But we also have to remember he is our king. He is our Lord. He is the one who sits on the throne and will sit on the throne forever and ever and ever just read Revelation. It's amazing when we see the description of eternity in the new heaven and the new earth with Jesus on the throne. Jesus is the one, according to Philippians, that at whose name every knee will bow and tongue confess. Think about that. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord. When we celebrate Jesus, we must remember that he came to save us. But we also must remember that he came as our Lord. That he is the king. And as his people, we are called to serve him. When we think about this, it's important for us to remember that as Jesus leads his people, he's not like some crazy dictator, right? I mean, we see dictators all over the world who mistreat their people, who don't care about the lives of people in their country, who will kill and torture and hurt anyone who disagrees with them. When we think about Jesus, Scripture tells us that he's the good shepherd. That he leads his people. That he cares for his people. That he lays down his life for the sheep. And as I was thinking about this, a, a, a video came to mind that I saw earlier this year. And I want to play it for you. Um, to remind us that we're sheep and that we need Jesus. Mm. <laughs> sheep is stuck, uh. stuck in a ditch. Uh. Someone sent me that video earlier in the year and I've, <laughs> I've seen it a few times. But that picture of a sheep stuck. <laughs> the sounds are great, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, we can stop it now. We don't need to, uh, yeah, okay, we don't need to watch it again. Um, but that's us. We're like sheep. 
And if we're left on our own, we're going to jump in ditches. We're going to get ourselves stuck. But we have a good shepherd who gets us out of the ditch. Not just once, (laughs) but twice. When we fail, when we fall, our good shepherd is there to protect us, to help us, to love us. When we think of Jesus being Lord, we, we have to acknowledge that he is our king, but we also remember that he leads us like a shepherd who cares for his flock and loves his flock. This Christmas, with everything else that's going on, I know many of you will leave here and go to Christmas parties. You'll meet with family. You'll open presents. You'll do all of those things that we associate with the celebration of Christmas. But as Christians, we have so much more to celebrate because Jesus is our Savior and He is our Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank You so much as we remember your birth, that we remember all that that meant and everything that you did, humbling yourself, being born and laid in a manger, proclaiming this good news not to kings, not to prophets, not to priests, not to scholars, but to shepherds. That you came to this world to proclaim the good news that although we are lost in our sins through your death you paid the price for us and Lord I pray that you will fill us with joy as we remember that you came to save us and fill us with joy that you came as the Christ the Lord the King We thank you that you have given us a path to follow. We thank you that you have not left us alone, but you are the good shepherd. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us remember why we celebrate this time of year. We pray this in your name. Amen.